everybody. Um, I'm here with James Blaha, the CEO of Vivid Vision, formerly known as Diplopia, if you guys have been checking up on our blog content for the past two years. So welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I guess um, maybe for those of you who um, are not super familiar with James's work, maybe you can just give a brief overview of who you are and um, sort of how you landed in San Francisco working on this project. Sure. Um, so I started uh, working on this about a year and a half ago. Um, when I first got my uh, DK1, um, I have a lazy eye, and so I thought I might try to improve my vision um, using the Oculus Rift because you can control uh, the image going to each eye, you know, separately. And you How did you first control. arrive upon that connection? Like, what was like that moment where you're like, this maybe VR could assist with this? Um, so I have been thinking about it in general for about the last three or four years, and without using a Rift or something like that, the next best way of doing it is using like a 3D projector system. Mm. So I was looking at building um, my own 3D projector system, but it would cost, you know, in the thousands of dollars to even experiment with it. Right. Um, and so when my friend got a DK1, um, and he was telling me about it, he was developing for it, um, that's kind of when I realized that this was 10 times cheaper and um, probably a lot better um, than the 3D project projector systems. So. And then, um, so my initial exposure to your work was you launched the Indiegogo campaign, um, right? So that was before you moved here, correct? Yeah, that would have been December 2013. Mm -hmm. um, and so during that campaign, you know, I, I was asking for $2,000 and ended up getting a lot uh, wider coverage than I was expecting um, and raised $20,000. Um, and during that, um, I had already been um, doing a lot of work with the Leap Motion. Um, so I got connected with the Leap Accelerator out here, uh, which was just next door here. So. Right. For those of you who aren't um, familiar, we ran um, a help support a Leap Accelerator program last year, um, which concluded around this time last year. Um, and essentially, what, there were 10 teams, I believe, or somewhere around there? Uh, nine teams, Nine yeah. teams, yeah. And um, they were all um, young startups uh, incorporating our technology in some way um, into their core product offering. And so... Um, James and um, his team were um, among those individuals who were part of that accelerator. So maybe can, can you talk a little bit about your experience within that accelerator, maybe what that process was like and um, sort of just day to day, what was the energy like there? Yeah, it was really, it was really cool coming together with nine teams um, and everyone was from outside of San Francisco, so all over the place. Um, you know, there was a team from India, um, there was a team from China, um, you know, team from teams from all over the U.S. Um, and we were just all, you know, working in this office space in a new place um, and coming together and um, kind of figuring out the same kinds of problems, even though we had all different companies and we were doing kind of completely different things, but we had the common uh, use of gesture control with Leap Motion. Yeah, and that was, I mean, I think that was even, V2 was just sort of coming out too, right? Or yeah, we were, I think we were some of the first people who were beta testing right. Skeletal and V2, and yeah. we got some of the, the really early versions. And Yeah, it was really great to have you guys, um, especially so close by, um, and just to sort of, you know, with feedback with engineers and all that stuff. Um, so, um and then I remember there was, so demo day was about May of last year. Yeah, it would have been middle of May. Yeah. Um, and I remember you guys gave a really strong presentation. It was a really momentous, like, I felt like it was a great day. And um, so can you tell me a bit, little bit about, like, what the f months after demo day looked like for you and your company and um, what that process was like? Because I mean, it's, it's this, you know, tricky line because, like, accelerators, there's all this momentum, and then all of a sudden you're out of the Yeah, yeah we've been very ended up um, being able to work full-time on it uh, still and uh, we, we started working on the clinical version uh, which we've just released um, about a week ago. 
So tell me a little bit about that. How did you, so I mean, you know, talking to investors is one thing, it's a pretty typical, you know, obviously a typical, um, you know, process that all startups need to go through, but not everybody, you know, being in the medical sphere, you have this other element where you have to get all these, you know, approvals and officiations, and so where did you even begin with that? Um, all of that was new to me before doing this, so yeah. it's been definitely uh, an interesting experience over the last year and a half. Um, yeah, I think in general, it seems from the outside, you know, if you're a programmer or something like that, um, that it's really hard to break into something that's kind of medically related. Um, but really, um, research teams, um, you know, at universities and hospitals um, and companies doing medical research, they really, really need programmers. That's something we found out um, that we didn't know. So we've had researchers contacting us from all over the world um, wanting, wanting to collaborate with us because they have, um, you know, the expertise and the know-how but they don't have the ability to actually build a lot of these things. Right. Um, or if they do, they can't do it quickly or it's very expensive for them. So they're, they're looking to collaborate with um, small startups or individuals. Um, and that's, I think that's true um, for all kinds of medical applications. So is that how you've been able to get your tech? I, I, I read, um, we did a blog feature on you, on you today, um, and um, it was, I read that your um, Technology in your game has been incorporated into some into some um, optometry offices. Like, what is that? Is that sort of a beta program, or what does that look like for you guys? Yeah, so we've been um, working directly with several optometry clinics across the U.S., um, and we're going to be rolling it out to more and more over the next couple months. Um, our first clinics were in Michigan, um, where we're from, um, Wow Vision in, in Grand Rapids and in, in St. Joseph. Um, and that's been really helpful on um, just kind of streamlining uh, the process for them, how, how they want to use it, what tools they want. And we're just trying to kind of provide a robust uh, suite of tools that they can use to do their vision therapy. Right. And so it's been, it's, it, has it been strictly patients who have lazy eye or some form of a, a condition like that? Yeah, yeah. And so right now we're very, very focused on um, lazy eye. I mean that's a huge problem in and of itself. I don't I don't know the the stats offhand, but I mean it affects a lot of people. Yeah. So um, depending on who you ask and where you draw the line at how severe it is, yeah. it's anywhere from uh, four to fifteen percent of all people. And that's a huge audience, right? Yeah. There. Yeah. It's a lot of people. Um, yeah. I remember from your initial presentations that yeah, one of your main points that was really compelling was that the treatments. Um, at that point in time were so rudimentary and like archaic that it, it seemed absurd that there had not been um, a more sophisticated and elegant solution in place. Yeah, I mean pretty much everyone who has it now um, does patching. They'll, they'll just basically cover up the good eye to try to force the person to use their weaker eye. Right, which if you're a nine-year-old kid, it's like nobody, there's all these like social barriers there that just would prevent a kid from wanting to use a, a solution like and that. And when you patch, you can't really use your other eye, so you're effectively blinding yourself, but knowing that you could be not blind if you just take the patch off. So the kid doesn't know the long-term implications of not following the treatment. Right. So like when I was a kid, I would peek out the side and watch TV when I was supposed to be using it three or four hours a day, and I would just lay in exactly the right angle so I could peek out the side with my good eye and just use my good eye with a sliver of the TV and that was still better than trying to use my weak eye. And I mean, you know, your solution sort of, I don't, maybe you can speak a little bit to like the game of, gamification aspect of it because I mean it seems like, you know, akin to a lot of us like in our generation to feel like, I like Mavis Beacon taught me how to type. You know, it'd be akin mm -hmm. to like putting on your Mavis Beacon instead of Instead of your typing form, you'd be put on, put on your um, Vivid Vision game or whatever yeah. um, to sort of help build up the skill set. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the gamification facet and how, like, did you have a game development background or did you just sort of learn by doing? Um, I had somewhat of a game development background. I was doing a lot of other kinds of development um, for the past 10 years. In the last two or three years, I had started experimenting with game development, trying to familiarize myself with it. Um, and that's how I got started working with Elite Motion, too, um, was with some of the games, uh, mini games, small games I was making uh, with the gesture tracking. Um, and so, you know, once, once this started taking off, I really dove headfirst into both uh, 
game design and game mechanics and also vision science and trying to find the right balance between um, keeping the software effective for improving vision but also making it fun to play so people actually do it. Right. One of the biggest challenges is um, people tend not to do their uh, therapies. You know, they, right. they give up because it takes a long time, you know. And how long, I mean, I guess the study is sort of ongoing. Um, how long How long did it take for you to sort of see a difference in your vision? And then what? do you have any initial data on how long it's taking people to see improvements or cures? Yeah, so we've seen um, improvements, you know, and this is in, um, in a controlled uh, controlled and masked environment. So yeah. this is kind of anecdotally, we've seen improvements. Um, people are telling us in about four to six weeks, um, playing half an hour, about five days a week. Versus patching or some other solution, like what? Like uh, that's usually hundreds of hours over years. Yeah. So it, it looks, you know, uh, according to our initial results, you know, we think we're 10 to 15 times faster. That's crazy. Um, and effective in adults where patching doesn't, you know, basically stops working yeah. when you're 10, 9 or 10. How, so, and have you, your participants, is it a, a wide age range so far, or is it, like, how have you been sort of, um, you know, controlling that? Um, so, so far it's been 14 and up. Okay. Um, and actually primarily 18 and up, um, but the study we're doing 14 and up. Yeah. Um, Question from the audience. Question from the audience. Is, uh... Are you guys using Leap Motion as a hand controller? Um, did you start using Leap Motion after Leap Accelerator? Um, why Leap Motion and not another hand control device? Um, did you try other hand controllers? Yeah, so we actually started with Leap Motion originally in the very first version. So awesome. yeah, um, the, so just to address one point, the Leap Accelerator in its initial iteration, um, it the one of the requirements to participate was that you had to incorporate Lee Motion technology to some degree. Um, so, yeah, that was, you definitely used it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was, um, the the hand tracking w was a main feature that, that I was always planning on from the very beginning. Um, and it it turned out, you know, we once we started talking to a lot of um, optometrists and vision therapists, that the hand tracking is one of, um, the number one features that we have that they're really excited about. Can you explain that a little bit? Like what, because I mean, it seems like you could, I, I um, that was one of the big initial questions that I had, like what role does hand tracking play with um, increasing your vision or curing lazy eye? Yeah, so there's been evidence um, that shows that combining perceptual learning, so I guess to go back a second, perceptual learning is just this idea that you can teach the brain how to interpret the information it's getting um, from the eyes uh, it better. Mm. You, you can teach it to improve how it responds to the information it's getting. So you're not physically changing how the eyes work, but you're just making the brain more efficient at using the information it's getting for useful tasks. Interesting. Um, and so there's been some research showing that um, mo doing motor tasks while doing perceptual learning tasks improves the effectiveness of the learning. Um, and so what's not clear right now, you know, most of those um, uh, studies have done motor tasks like tapping your fingers back and forth like this while you're answering the questions of mm -hmm. which one is closer, or which one is more rotated, or whatever the visual task is. Um, and a lot of people right now think um, that it's probably true that the more um, parts of the body you're getting involved, if someone can stand up and interact with things naturally, that that should be better than just moving their fingers. Um, so, you know, with the Oculus, if you can stand up and walk around in a small area and use your hands, you know, in a one-to-one, -one lifelike uh, 3D environment, that probably should be better um, than using a gamepad or using a mouse and keyboard or something yeah. like that. So, and then to address, um, yeah, did you try any other controllers along the way or? We did. We tried pretty much all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we always ended up coming back to Leap because you know, it's, uh, the tracking is still, for what we're doing, um, the best. Yeah. It's actually an interesting, uh, not, I don't want to say misconception, but especially in VR, like, I, I feel like as a company, um, we've been, like, a lot of the, a lot of people say, you know, it, basically, Leap Motion doesn't have to be the sole input. Like, it's a
for any sound issues, everybody. Um, anyways, I guess the point is, like, it's it, it's definitely, especially in these early days of VR, so crucial to just experiment with the whole breadth of, of what's out there. And, um, and especially in your case, like, incorporating the tools that um, expedite the process more, like, that's the goal, right? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's it's something we've noticed with hand tracking is that people who play a lot of games, um, they tend to prefer the Xbox controller because um, they're really used to it. Yeah. Um, we have small kids and older people who um, don't really play games, who aren't familiar with games, um, almost all prefer the hand tracking. Mm. Um, and it's a lot easier for them to pick up than an Xbox controller. Yeah. Um, and so we've, we're supporting kind of both modes, um, but it seems like people, the vision therapists and optometrists are going to be using primarily hand tracking with most of their yeah. uh, patients. I didn't grow up with a console, and I always was like that kid who just didn't understand. I was like, what is this X thing? Like, I, I just, I feel like it's not intuitive to everybody. Yeah. But if you grew up as a, as a gamer, then it's a different story. So it's definitely, I feel like you have to cater to whoever the patient is, you know? Yeah. And in our case, you know, most people in general are not gamers, so. Um, yeah. Most people seem to prefer the hand tracking. Yeah. So far, so. Yeah, I guess in the Bay Area bubble, it seems like everyone here yeah. had some sort of formative <laughs> gaming experience. But um, okay, um, yeah. Did you um, did you have anything else in terms of the um, UCSF uh, study? Like what part? Like so, at what point are you? Like what stage are you guys in that right now? Yeah. So we've had um, people um, participating in the study. Um, we're doing kind of a rolling admission, so we're going to keep adding more people into the study as time goes on. And how do people get involved if they want to get involved? Um, so you can go to our website, uh, cvividly.com. There's a contact link there that goes straight to me um, and just contact us saying that you're interested. Um, basically, if you live in the Bay Area, you have lazy eye, um, and you would be able to come, come into San Francisco a few times over uh, two months. Um, then we could send you home with the hardware and the software and, and try it out, and they'll you know, measure your vision and monitor it over time. Good opportunity for anybody out there who either um, has some form of this condition or knows somebody who does. Um, definitely. Um, and so you, yeah, so you guys give them all the hardware and everything, and then mm -hmm. they um, just, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so maybe um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about sort of the game development process and um, and I don't, well, sort of a big a big uh, theme of the piece uh, this morning that we published was about how essentially gaming, VR gaming, um, can affect your brain. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so kind of uh, to generally answer the question, yeah. um, we look at VR as a platform for presenting um, the visual system with input. So we can kind of control the visual system of the brain, what exactly what it's seeing at any given time. And then we can also use the head tracking and their responses in the games and the hand tracking to measure uh, their, you know, their response, uh, basically. And so as, VR, as both the sensors and the, the VR hardware get better, we're basically getting a better and better way of presenting the brain with an input and measuring the output yeah. so we can figure out how it works so we can change how the brain works uh, to make it you know work better is it I, I, I feel like this is there's there's a it's both a blessing and a curse to be working on a project like this sort of on the precipice of as all these technologies are maturing like everything is maturing really rapidly but I feel like the space still has a lot ways, a lot of ways to go like definitely, is that yeah. difficult or do you feel like it's kind of cool to be on the front edge of that um, it's definitely cool to be on the front edge I think um, things are you know we've passed a point where it's useful enough uh, for our purposes to, to make it a useful tool for people um, obviously as the hardware gets better it becomes a better tool we have more options um, you know with really good eye tracking that obviously opens a lot of doors for us mm -hmm. um, that's one of the big features that we're waiting for someone to really do well because um, you know we're not in the business of making right. any hardware we're using hardware other people are making yeah I feel like I, I listen to a couple like VR podcasts and I feel like everything is always like what's the killer app what's the killer app and I don't know my my reaction is always a little bit like what if the killer app is healthcare like that is kind of an interesting scenario in which like the space that's notoriously sort of reluctant um, to 
new technology oftentimes, you know, in a hospital you walk around and every, you know, every computer seems to be like 80 years old and it's, but what if, what if the medical sphere is actually the one, is actually the space that is able to, because of this need, you know, adapt the quickest. I don't know. It's an interesting scenario. I don't yeah, know if it will happen. I think it's one of them. Yeah. Um, I think obviously gaming is a killer app, um, cinema, and I think healthcare, but maybe those, and maybe, um, like journalism, I think those are probably journalism. Yeah, interesting. Um, How so? Um, Just like media consumption in general, or I think VR is a good way of kind of um, evoking emotional responses from people mm -hmm. um, better than watching just a video. Um, and just like uh, you know, uh, video changed how people saw the Vietnam War, for instance. Um, VR might might change how people see events going on. Uh, across the globe, if you can actually kind of stand in someone else's perspective right. um, directly, yeah. it seems like that could be a, a really compelling way to do journalism. It's a good sort of flip on the argument against um, throwing all resources into VR, which is like that VR will encapsulate us into these bubbles that we're already sort of in. And if you think of it in, in the sense of maybe it will transplant you and expand your worldview even more than it ever could. That's a really interesting way to sort of say, hey, there's two sides to this. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because it's, the technology is just more powerful. And then how you use it, you could use it to p keep people in a bubble or you could use it to you know, do, I don't know, like Fox News style journalism to convince people of things. Or you, know, you could use it to kind of spread other people's um, yeah. points of view. So it, I'm going to be thinking about this VR as tool for like uh, coercion, <laughs> media co coercion. It's really, really interesting. Like the Rush Limbaugh of VR. Like, <laughs> what does that look like? That's really intriguing. They're probably working on it now. I've, okay, <laughs> everyone go write think pieces on this. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so we were just going to talk about the hand control element. Um, yeah, maybe uh, maybe you can talk about some other sort of as the VR space is evolving. Like, how how are you um, how are you handling some pro common pro um, problems in VR, such as like audio haptics stuff like that? Like, what do you mm -hmm. what are you doing to address those as the space matures? Um, right now, I guess the biggest thing we're doing is making everything we're working on really modular. Um, so if, if we want to switch out a headset or switch out to a different kind of audio, um, you know, every, a lot of different people are working on different 3D audio solutions. I know Oculus is working on that themselves, yeah. and um, I've seen a couple other companies. Um, so you know, there's there's a lot of competition right now, and no, you can't figure out who's going to kind of succeed. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're a developer, you just have to make sure that you can support different hardware. The agnostic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're we've been doing as much as possible just to do to do that. And yeah. and that's one of the reasons too we're doing a lot of separate mini games um, because we can focus on different visual exercises. Also people like different kinds of games and also um, with different games we can support different kinds of hardware. Yeah. Um, Have you done anything to adapt to mobile at all? Or are you still pretty much solely Oculus? Like so we have a version working on Gear VR. Cool. Um, and in the long run, we definitely, I mean, I, I think the way most people will experience VR is through their phones. Yeah. It, it, se it seems like that's the way things are heading. Yeah. Um, and so I think if you can't support mobile, then, you know, you're going to probably miss out on most of the people who are using VR. Yeah. Having said that, I feel like, uh, yeah, the mobile VR experience is not where... It's it's not nearly where um, sort of the more native experience is right now. I at mean, least your VR is close. Yeah, you know? at, at least the demos I've experienced, it always just feels like I don't know. It it always still still feels really flat to me. I don't mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. but maybe maybe that's just what I've experienced so far, and I'm really excited to see it again. Like the space, like so rapidly, just like evolving. Um, even like a year from now, six months from now, we're gonna be seeing it. Some interesting so stuff. The phones have to be made to be VR ready. Exactly. So exactly. We're not like. The the uh, note four is like sort of made to be it gear VR or like, like VR ready, but it, it's yeah. kind of pushed in, kind of packed in there. It know? feels very Frankenstein-y. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Um. So okay, maybe um. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can um play through the game a little bit. Is that sure. cool? Yeah, okay. you could try it out, and okay. I can um 
So we have this interface for the, either the vision therapist or the optometrist to kind of control the experience going on inside. symbol which tells you what power-up it is, that's only in the, the weak eye too. Um, and so the weak eye has to track the ball and identify the symbols inside the power-ups um, in order to uh, win the game. And so we can also change certain things. So one of the things that happens if people have lazy eyes is that they suppress their weaker eye. Um, if their good eye goes in the future, so we can increase brightness of certain objects in the scene um, to the weak eye and decrease it to the strong eye and that helps overcome the suppression. Um, and so once we're, we've overcome the suppression, people can practice using their weak eye and over time, um, because we're providing an incentive for their brain to use both eyes together, um, fused on the same image, um, they can learn to you know, gain depth perception and use both their eyes. I can see this being really addictive and fun for patients, and even just like I mean, I'm, I'm obviously I have regular vision. I wear contact lenses, but I I um, it's really fun and it's something that I would play even if I if there wasn't a health related goal, which is good. Yeah, we you know again our, our patients are kind of your normal uh, average person who doesn't play a lot of games. So we try to make the games kind of simple and fun for, for every. Yeah, I'm like your match three gamer. Like, I like very basic, you know, sort of, um, I don't want to say mindless, but just, um, you know, stuff where there's an immediate sense of reward. Um, so I feel like I would be, I don't know, it's, 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 it's sort of like addictive, um, quick satisfaction type mechanics that are super fun. So we have another game you can try out that yeah. might be more along This one is kind of aimed at a different, um, is aimed primarily to help improve depth perception. So you want to pop these bubbles from the closest one to the farthest one, and the one in the middle is just a guide, the white one, it's not a bubble. Um, and so if you only use one of your eyes, um, it'll be uh, really, really difficult to tell which one. Oh, that's win. totally, yeah. So that's for instance, I could um, you know, hide one of your eyes here. Oh yeah, it's it's a lot harder to um, it's a lot harder to tell um, when with only one eye which one is um, which one is the the closest to you. This is really interesting. So we've removed all of the clues um, for depth that you can get with one eye. So like shadows, or if you know how big it is, or um, parallax. So the bubbles are locked to your to your view wherever you look, so you can't move your head back and forth to figure out which one is closer. Yeah, um, and again, this mechanic is like it's very ageless. Like you, you 
I could see a five-year-old thinking this is fun. I could see like a 65-year-old thinking this is fun. You know what I mean? It's, that's, it's really interesting. Can't stop. <laughs> so how many experiences do you currently have in your arsenal? Uh, we have three right now, but we're going to be releasing two more um, over the next month or two to the clients that we're using. Um, one of which will be a jewels type game, you know, uh, matching three. We've been um, experimenting a lot with VR games to try to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, what have you um, figured out that doesn't work for any of the VR devs out there who are sort of trying um, and failing or trying and trial and error? One of our big rules is that we never move the, the camera. Um, the only way the camera moves is by the person's own head movement. Um, we move stuff around the camera, you know, but we keep the, the person stationary in their environment. Yeah, um, isn't it the idea that like positional tracking and all that will get better? Too? Yeah, yeah. Right now, um, you know, motion sickness is the main concern. As long as you, you know, design the experience correctly, you can prevent ninety-five percent of motion. Sickness. Do you get resistance from optometrists on the basis of motion sickness, or do, are, is, is VR still sort of like you have to guide them through? Um, you know, a small percentage of people are just really prone to it. Yeah. Um, but as long as you keep your frame rate high and um, design the experiences correctly, you can mitigate almost all of that. So we, we haven't really had any issues or reports from the clinics using it um, about that. Um, but we've put in a lot of work and testing to prevent it. And we've thrown away whole games just because, you know, the game couldn't be done without... Um, making some percentage of the people a little queasy. Do you know any stats about like the percentage of people that that it seems to affect? Like, because I mean, you know, a certain percentage of the population gets motion sickness or uh, um, you know, seasickness. So it does seem like. Do and actually, my my mom is really really prone to motion sickness, but she doesn't get it in these games. Interesting. Um, I've done a lot of demos <laughs> over the past year and a half, so I would guess that probably one percent of people are, are just really prone to it and almost no matter what you do until the, the latency gets a little better maybe yeah um, and the head tracking gets better they're probably going to get sick um, and everyone else as long as you you know don't move the camera around without them expecting it to move um, or you know have the game stutter um, they'll, they'll probably be fine and I, I think with some of the newer uh, hardware, um, it probably won't be an issue even for that 1%. Once you get it as good as it needs to be, it'll be fine for everyone. You know? Right. Um, and you, did you say you had one more experience? Yeah. Did you build this in Unity? Yeah. This is all Unity. Uh, which goes back to wanting to keep things modular um, yeah. and supporting whatever comes out, because everyone's going to be supporting Unity. Uh, so this one, you could just use one hand to control the ship. Oh, okay, got it. Um, it's only in your left eye right now. That would be the strong eye. Um, and then there's these rings, which are only in your... Uh, the symbols inside the rings are only in your right eye. So you want to fly through them if it's a blue up arrow, like this one, um, and avoid it if it's a down red arrow. Um, and you can close your hand up into a fist to fire the lasers. And they fire wherever your head's pointing. So you have to move your head to keep track of the asteroid. Sounds a little hard. So is, did you design the... So we can adjust the difficulty of the game and um, all of the kind of vision therapy variables that are involved live. Um, and so the vision therapists can see what the person's seeing. VR kind of respond to that and um, change it to match their current uh, either visual ability or skill level. So is the idea that the patient takes us home with them, or is it the idea that they that they can put the therapy in the um, office with the doctor present to evaluate them? So right now, um, primarily it's in office only, but we're doing some some beta tests with a couple of clinics where they're sending it home with you. 
Um, so we're going to be doing both. Um, but right now, it's going to be primarily in clinic until we further develop the home version. Right. Um, is there is there an, a, a, a system for sort of tracking progress? Um, I guess it's for like the home release, or is it for used to working? Yeah, so all of the, when you play the game, we're collecting a bunch of data about your vision. Um, so we can see how, how the person's vision is changing over time. Um, and the, the doctor, when they're sending people home with it, they can monitor that. And we have a bunch of vision tests also to kind of assess um, what's going on with their vision. Um, contrast sensitivity and acuity and uh, uh, stereo acuity and stuff like that. Um, and so. You know, the plan is you go into the doctor, maybe you get, they'd use it a little bit with you in the clinic, um, and then if you want to do it more, they can send you home with it and then monitor progress and call you up if they see something, maybe they want you to come in, or, um, you know, maybe things are going fine and they can just talk to you over the phone or through email. And at this point, have you been able to rule, um, like, patients, like, obviously you said your vision has pretty much been cured, like, Um, you know, without without finishing the, the study and a real a real big mass and controlled study, then I I can't really say anything for for sure. Yeah. You know, I I know it worked for me. Right. Um, in my particular case, and we've had people tell us that it worked for them, um, but we don't know specifically exactly um, which classes of amblyopia and strabismus um, it works best for, how much, or you know maybe. Um, you know, what, what age range is. So these are kinds of the questions that we're answering now with the study. So there are a lot of different variations of these conditions? Or... Yeah, there, so there are a lot of different causes. Um, and then these are kind of, it, it's really a class of different things um, that are all sort of related. And so each one of the big things I've learned meeting a lot of people who have lazy eye over the past year and a half is that everyone's case is, is somewhat unique, even though you know, there are similarities between people. Um, but you, you definitely need um, to be able to tailor what's going on to their specific case. Um, so that's you know the big reason why we're having optometry clinics um, using because really they need to kind of assess the situation and um, make sure it's uh, right for that patient. Right. So we're just giving them the tools to, to kind of do that. sort of um, our uh, our easiest on-ramp, which is actually what this student is saying, that, that you built this in Unity. What was your experience like? You could use like? Playmaker in Unity. Yeah, Playmaker um, is a good one, too. Um, yeah. Um, James, do you have any, like, what was your experience like building with like, Motion in Unity? Um, what, do you have any tips for people who are just starting out? It was actually really easy. I mean, I just, you know, for, um, for the breaker game, we had been using a paddle for a long time, um, and then we were, you know, mapping the hand onto the paddle to control it, and then we ended up just dropping in the, the hand prefab that you guys supplied. Um, and people seem to like that a lot better, being able to like reach out and really hit the ball uh, yeah. with their hands. So it's it's actually, you know, even if you're if you're not really a programmer, but you're someone learn to use the application, then I think, you know, you drag in the prefab for Oculus, drag in the prefab for Leap, and use Playmaker or something that half triggers, and you could probably, you know, I, I've seen some pretty good Unity experiences from people who aren't really programmers. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's, with Unity, it's like if you have any sort of, like, sort of basic, uh, sort of understanding of game design, and even if you just have a really compelling idea, you'll pretty much be able to execute it, it seems like. Um, what I've seen in the community, which is really awesome, and, um, and it also seems like for, um, you know, for something like this, you know, uh, scaling it, you know, being able to provide lots of experiences quickly, um, with different sort of creative differences, um, I feel like Unity or Unreal would both be, Unity especially would be really good to just to sort of 
build on experiences quickly that people will be uh, interested in. Again, sort of, it seems like you'd be, you'd be able to cater it to the patient for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, originally, before, even when I was buying the first DK1, I was a very big skeptic. At the time, I didn't think, or at the time, I couldn't see in 3D, and I thought VR is 3D, and 3D is a gimmick. Um, and then when I got it, and I still couldn't see in 3D at this time, and I put it on the first time, and then I could look around my, a whole the room, and I was really in that room. I feel like the, the really compelling part of it is that it convinces you that you're really in another place. Um, I guess the presence aspect is what mm -hmm. most people call it. Um, and it seems like we're going to have really, really good visual and, and auditory. Um, uh, we're we're going to be able to fool people into thinking they're really in those places with at least um, sound and, and video. Mm -hmm. um, and as time goes on, probably haptics too, although that's you know farther out. Yeah, at this point, the hap haptic stuff, it's like every, all the conferences that have, um, like, haptics heavy, it's like you basically are putting on a big suit, and you look yeah. really silly in real life, but yeah. it's still really cool. There are a lot of interesting haptic solutions out there brewing, but... And it needs to cost the right amount, too, if that's the hard part. Um, have you tried mounting the leap to any of the places on the Rift, apart from the traditional position, um, and compare how it works? We have a little bit, especially in the beginning before you guys came out with the mounts. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've, we're doing it with scotch tape and yeah, rubber we bands. Yeah, saw some and very <laughs> creative, I'll say, solutions. Um, and the mount was essentially, you know, mostly to just sort of provide a slightly more elegant solution than duct tape. Although, basically, every hackathon that we were going to, we were on this, like, really intense hackathon sprint. And I feel like every weekend we were going to hackathons. And all of a sudden, I think it was around... I think it was around like last winter, I want to say January, February, when more people started getting access to VR hardware. Um, and every hackathon, it was like duct tape and leap. And it, we didn't even, it wasn't even something that we had instructed people to do. We, we were just doing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. You know, yeah. you get tracking where you can see. Um, but we've also, you know, had the more typical put the leap in front of them. Mm -hmm. uh, some people prefer, prefer that for certain kinds of experiences. Obviously, that wouldn't really make sense for, um, like, the breaker game where um, you're always kind of looking where your hands are going to be hitting it. Um, but for the space game where you're moving your head around while you're controlling it, that might make sense to put it down on the table in front of you so it doesn't move with your head. Right. Um, and we've done some stuff with 3D printing. Um, we've 3D printed some of the, the head mounts and stuff and angled them down a little bit and mm -hmm. tried that out. Um, but it seems like, in general, 
for I, I think the best place right now is pointing forward from the yeah. from the headset. We definitely prototyped a lot of things in house, and um, just you know a lot of a lot of factors went into the decision for the official mount. Um, but you know, like basically our VR tracking is still sort of in um, beta phase. It's not quite as robust as the top up tracking, so um, we just had to find like the a, w a way that it would sort of still have that you know quality assurance and um so it's, it's definitely come a long way since we were beta testing it at the accelerator yeah cause. yeah it's our software is constantly as you guys know evolving and um it's really it's really interesting to watch <laughs> it's a really interesting and and difficult problem to be tackling um a lot of smart math phds here who are crazy and yeah. crazy equations on the walls um does anybody else in the audience have any questions for James or about Leap Motion in general? Okay, they talk about it because of that great Twitch t lag. <laughs> <laughs> um, but talk uh, about your co-founder. So James, how did you and Manish meet each other? Your oh yeah, how did you meet your co-founder? Yeah, so my co-founder, Manish, he couldn't be here today because he actually just left uh, back to Michigan where we're from for a I, few I weeks. I spoke to him on Sunday, and he said he was very sad that he that you were getting he was, the spotlight. He was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I actually went to high school with Manish. Um, I've known him for, I guess, 12 or 13 years now. Um, and after we graduated, we had done a couple of projects here and there, kind of all, all over the place. Our backgrounds are kind of... Very, we, we've done a lot of different kinds of projects. What's his background? Um, he's you know, a software developer. Um, I pr was primarily doing web design, web development, um, kind of the full stack um, there. And he was doing, uh, he was working for IBM before this. Oh, interesting. Um, doing kind of enterprise software. Yeah. Um, but we both have, uh, you know, we, we both do kind of projects kind of Sometimes video games or some, you know, we were doing some cryptocurrency work before this and um, kind of all over the place. So um, we just have a lot of general programming experience. Yeah. I guess. One thing I really love about the VR dev community is that a lot, since it's such a, um, there's so much to work with spatially, you kind of have to inherently be um, design driven. Um, do you feel like you, you always sort of had that mindset, maybe with the web experience, or do you feel like that's something that you've, developed along the way? Yeah, both Manish and I are actually very design. Um, we, we've, we did a lot of the front end design too, and then connecting all of that to the back end design. Um, so I feel like that definitely helps because you have to, ha you have to kind of figure out these high level rules because it's a new medium yeah. that has its own rules. Right. Um, and so you, you can't just read off a list exactly what to do right now. Um, I mean, there are some probably good lists by now um, but especially in the beginning, everyone was kind of just experimenting and figuring it out on their own and seeing what worked and what didn't. So the design really helps from that point of view of kind of thinking what the user ex experience is going to be and which things matter and how to kind of guide them through the experience in the least painful, most smooth way possible. Yeah, I think it's great that, um, that, that the VR medium, you know, sort of warrants developers, pro uh, engineers to be more design to be design think you know, design thinking and um, I don't know I think that's a really it's a, such a strange space to be in right now but um, we do uh, just a general call out we do have a, like a, a white paper VR best practices white paper that's on our dev portal that a lot of people have been telling us have uh, has been helpful especially if you're just starting out with VR development there's a lot to sort of dive into and um, yeah we yeah, it's, it's... Is that by Jody? Yeah. yeah I've um, seen her speak a couple of times about that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, that's... Yeah, she's been in this field for a long time, and um, she has some really just very elegant things to say about the whole um, thing. So it's... Um, and we also, on the blog, you know, pulled out a bunch of those features and highlighted them into more digestible chunks if you don't have time to sit down and read a whole white paper because it's quite long. Um, but for the academics in the crowd... Go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. Um, there, there's one question about um, about tracking, um, and I think we sort of talked about that a little bit. Um, but 
Um, our software is constantly changing and evolving and, and improving. Um, so, but having said that, um, you know, we, I, I personally, as you guys, some of you guys know, I'm very um, sort of present on the forums and our social channels, and I'm happy to relay directly any feedback that you have about the tracking to our engineers, because, you know, we are still a small, small startup, so I would definitely emphasize the fact that if you have feedback about the tracking, let us know. Um, that was one of the major benefits of the accelerator, having basically this beta lab of people like constantly giving us very specific feedback, a lot of which directly fed into you know our software pipeline. So it's really um, yeah, it's, that, it's really important to keep the conversation going with you guys. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Looks like our. Um, our friend over here in the chat has been providing you guys with some links, and um, I think that's about it for this week. So thanks, James, for joining us. Um, it was really great to have you. Uh, stay tuned on the blog and our social channels for updates on the study. Um, we'll definitely be keeping up with James and Manisha's adventures along the way. And um, definitely feel free, as always, to reach out. Um, I'm our social manager, Kate. I realize I never introduced myself at the beginning of the hour. so. I'm Kate. Um, you can tweet at me at Leap Motion or Leap Motion Dev. Um, reach out on Facebook. Um, email us at developers at leapmotion.com with any development related quandaries. We're happy to um, bug our engineers and have them sort of weigh in on possible solutions for you guys. So, um, yeah, and all, we tune in um, next week. We'll be, we're, here, we're here pretty much every, every Tuesday at 5 p.m. PST. So, um, we really appreciate you guys tuning in. See you next week. Bye.